Thanks, Jules. No, I, I, um, I mean, when we set out to do that report, I, I guess you know you could describe it in a very sort of grandiose way as what does a low carbon economy have to do with a circular economy, or more prosaically, perhaps you know how many megatons or gigatons of CO2 reduction sit in achieving a more circular economy, and. Uh, in a way, you'd have thought that we've had a long discussion about um, recycling, about resource efficiency, about various of these topics, but somehow they've never really quite been put uh, on the same page. And so we approached it with some humility, you know, thinking, you know, we will, we will have to listen and see what's out there and found that actually there was a really timely need for a, um, for a, for a sort of aggregation and synthesis exercise here. Um, the context here from a climate perspective is that we have, of course, talked a lot about energy, low carbon energy, renewable energy, energy efficiency. These are the mainstays of a energy transition. And this energy in terms of course, propels, you know, transportation, heats buildings, it provides power, uh, etc. Um, and we have talked much less about materials. And uh, the materials here are um, steel, aluminium, um, cement, um, plastics and chemicals. Um, and these are quite invisible in our everyday life. You know, plastics is more visible now, perhaps, than, than, than others. Um, but nonetheless, are you know, ubiquitous to, to our societies. And, and a couple of points on that. One is that we have long looked at how we can use more energy more efficiently. And how can we get the same uh, mobility, the same thermal comfort in buildings, the same power, but use less energy? But we never really asked the same questions of our materials. We've never really asked, okay, uh, do we need to have 12 tons of steel each? Do we need to use 100 kilograms of plastics each? Uh, or are there ways that we can reduce the production of new materials uh, but still have the same amount of economic well-being? That, of course, is exactly the same point that the, many of the circular economy concepts try to get at. But what we did in the report then is to collate those that have the most impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And you know, the, what we found is that uh, we could address something like, this was in a European context then, um, where we developed this, um, something like half of the emissions from uh, the production of materials could be addressed by looking at the demand side, by looking at how we use and reuse and recirculate materials, rather than just looking at, well, we also need to do that, but just looking at the production and the emissions that arise there. And, and when you established that logic, did you feel that you had to, did you get some pushback? Did you feel that you had to uh, do an extra effort when it came to pedagogy because some of the discourse was so well established that, and it had been for about 20, 25 years. How was it yeah. received? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that definitely uh, in that we are, we are very used to thinking of emissions in terms of producing things and then thinking in terms of now we need to reduce emissions from that production. So it's, there's been long been a debate about can we have carbon capture, can we have new industrial processes? Whereas the use of materials, I mean, materials cross borders, they are not consumed where they are produced. They are, uh, as I said, much of the use, the use is invisible in everyday life, et cetera. So it took quite a lot of, um, what shall I call it, almost education in order to so it, in order to show that a lot of the emissions actually arise from, from, um, from a use in, you know, in automotive sector, in the building sector, in packaging and in other uses. Um, and so that the sort of it, it challenges a bit the um, the traditional way of accounting for emissions or having a conversation about emissions in, in the climate community and climate debates. That said, I think there was a big a lot of readiness because there's on the other hand a big appreciation that these emissions are among the trickiest of the mold to address. Uh, it's very difficult to cut the emissions from steel uh, or from plastics production or from cement production. And uh, when we found here that actually there's more that can be done that has been part of the debate so far, there was quite a lot of interest in that. And interestingly, you talk about plastics and steel. I mean, intuitively, steel, you understand because of the need for super high temperature, of course, it's energy intensive. You, you would be tempted to think that plastics is a much easier issue to solve. Is that correct or is it counterintuitive? No, I mean, I, I think it's, it's not correct, actually. I think plastics are at least as difficult as it turns out. I mean, and, and if I take these three, they're difficult for different reasons. So it's true that high temperatures and energy intensity are, are, big, are a big deal and part of the story here. But another one is that we actually use the carbon today in, as part of the process chemistry. And when we produce steel, we have to get the iron out of the iron ore. And then to do that, we use carbon. And it's, um, 
and it's not so much a, um, a question of um, not just a question of energy then or, or the energy use and likewise of course when we make plastics they are literally built in out of carbon um, you know, so if you take the plastics that are produced every year and you think of that in terms of carbon dioxide equivalent it turns out just that carbon that sits in the product mm. which is today is new fossil carbon is as big as aviation in the emissions terms right and everyone knows we need to do something about flying everyone knows we have to do something about uh, our fuels it's much less sort of realized that that fossil carbon that we use as materials is also a, a very big deal in emissions terms yeah, which takes us straight to the argument that we're making in the, in the climate paper that we released uh, during Climate Week in New York together with you guys. And maybe if we can have the, the slide on the screen that shows the split between energy and, and products in terms of the emissions. Maybe you can take us into more detail with regards of what sits where. Because as you were saying, you challenge the way you look at these and maybe there's a bit of recategorization of those figures as well. So traditionally, industry emissions might be uh, embedded into the whole uh, energy discussion as mm -hmm. a whole, which is slightly misleading because then you can't really pull them out and, and apply new strategies to them. So if we could have the, um, the slide on, on screen, then maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, so, so one, one piece of this is, of course, uh, land use and agriculture, which we highlighted in the report. I mean, we talk, I've talked mostly about materials now. Uh, and there, it's not so much about carbon as it is about um, other types of greenhouse gases. And, and they arise from our use of fertilizer, from livestock, from the balance of carbon between soils and soils in the atmosphere and land, uh, different uh, as well as forests in the atmosphere. Um, and so that's, that's a big part of the fortify that we see there. And, and our food production system then is, is very greenhouse gas uh, emissions intensive. But it's not so much a, a, a carbon budget and, and low carbon and all of that. It's, it's a different type of logic. And the other half of the fortify there is industry. And when we talk about industry, there is, of course, energy use in industry as well. But even if you take that out and you put it back in, into the 55 and you talk about all the electricity used in industry, well, that's part of the energy part of the equation here. There are large emissions from in the, the, the big parts of the emissions from industry are precisely those we've talked about. It's a story about steel, about cement, about chemicals, about embedded carbon. Uh, and then you can add to that, you can add aluminium and copper and some others. And many of these have, as I said, carbon released as an integral part of how we produce these materials, not for its energy, but as part of the chemistry. And so we have to do one of two things here. Um, we can't, well, the first thing to notice that there are sort of workhorses of energy transition here to use renewable energy, to use energy efficiency. By all means, we should deploy them as much as we can, but they will not address the whole problem. And so the two things we can do, we can uh, either create entirely new production processes or we can capture the carbon, you know, that's on the production side. That's been fairly well established and discussed. Um, and the other thing we can do, as I said, is uh, to... Uh, reduce the amount of new materials that we need by recycling materials, by reusing products, by being more efficient with uh, eliminating waste and being more efficient in our use. And um, I guess the story here, I mean, intuitively it makes sense. Um, why not get the most economic value and greenhouse gas emissions reductions out of it? Um, but um, it then turns out that actually that changes the conversation quite a lot in terms of what is in a climate strategy. Well, this is all but invisible to date. And so we think it's really high high time, we, we need every, every, we can't leave any stones unturned here, we need everything we can access in order to cut these very tricky emissions. Yeah, we'll come back to that because that's a really important point going mm -hmm. forward, but you raised the, the, the point of getting more use out of the product, uh, increasing the utilization rate, which has an impact on and is driven by the business models that we use as well. At the mm -hmm, moment, sure. linearity drives throughput and, and volume sales. Uh, if we want to uh, get to a model whereby companies sell the use of their equipment and the service and retain ownership, then the whole, the, the cost structure of the economy needs to be challenged as well. The incentives are not the same. The fiscal framework to a certain extent needs to change as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a conversation that needs to be had because we can't think that simply because circular economy seems like a good idea, it's on a level playing field within linear system. One has been hardwired for and by 
the economy as we know it, and the other one is a new idea. So how do we get that conversation as well and say, if you want to drive, and that may be a long shot, but if you want to uh, drive the, uh, the charge on the climate crisis, you are going to start selling the use of your products and keeping your products as material banks. You know, th there's a mm -hmm. lot to unpack in that. The, the journey mm -hmm. is pretty long. So what sort of pedagogy can be used? What's in it for business? And what can business do? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a lot of, lot of, lot of questions that, I mean, I, I think you're perfectly right. And, you know, you can just contrast the production side of, the, of, these, uh, of these sectors. You know, you've got extremely optimized production processes that are now in many, in most cases, 100, well, 70 to 100 years old, that really are amazing production systems in their own right. But of course, with continued use of virgin resources and as this, you know, this work highlights and large greenhouse gas emissions as well. Whereas we are only at the beginning of exploring the much more numerous different types of uh, ways of, of, as I said, of, of circular economy solutions. So there's a, there's a timing issue here, but it's also, you know, as long as, long as you know, one, one simple answer is of course that as long as materials to keep not paying the, the full way. Uh, there will always be an up, uphill struggle here, but there's also much more of a uh, of, an, of an innovation journey, frankly, right, in, in this. I, I think, I mean, the, the easiest way I think of talk, thinking about this is something like car sharing, uh, a car sharing system. We can, we can perhaps talk a bit about that because in my head, it, there's a big debate. Is it a good thing? Is it not? It causes some sort of dislocation. It, 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 it challenges um, existing ways of doing things and so on. And, and what we want to bring to the table with this work is to say that, well, however that plays out, and we have to design it in the right way and, 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 and all the rest, um, one of the big benefits is that we can have a much, we, we need much less materials in order to get the mobility that we need. Uh, and therefore, we also have, um, you know, addressing quite a big pool of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. And so I think one is also just to take all of the different benefits and, and questions and put them on the table together. Uh, and then, of course, there's still the hard work of, of changing consumer behavior or in expectations and of aligning incentives in regulations and big and small and, and of the big innovation. Here. But at the moment, we are not even clear that there's a huge prize at the end of it. And, uh, and I guess, you know, greenhouse gases add, mitigation adds to all the other benefits of the circular economy now. So what I take away from what you're saying is that actually a, a, a colossal part of the problem sits with design in the first place. It's Absolutely. about the way yeah. we, uh, we conceive the products and the buildings and the infrastructure yeah. being overly generous, to put it mildly, with the material intensity. And that maybe yeah. hasn't caught up with uh, technological innovations. And we're still pumping loads of more materials than needed Whereas, in fact, structural engineering could help reduce that, for instance, or maybe yeah. design for durability. And there's a question that just came in uh, from our listeners. Uh, that, that's an interesting high-level one, and you, you can answer that very simply if you want, giving the, uh, the example of the, of the reaction you had in your interactions with businesses and politicians. Does breaking down the issue in terms of energy and products make it seem more manageable? So I'm, I'm not sure if the implication yeah. here is that it's only a, an illusion of being more manageable or is actually because it's helping people get a grip on it. No, I, mean, I think it's critical that we do it. And, and, and here's why. Uh, ultimately, what we can do in climate terms is a, is a question of uh, having the right market solutions and having the right governance technology, a technology in place and having the right governance in institutions as in some centers, right? And it's only once you've identified something as an important issue that all of these start coming into place. And so if you take energy efficiency, we have had energy efficiency institutions and policy and debate and investigations um, and lots of technology development for, you know, since oil prices, that was when that really, really took off. And we've achieved tremendous amounts through that, but we don't have anything like it for the way we use materials in society. And climate is only, as I said, only one reason to think about this, but it is a big enough piece of the puzzle that it really deserves its own debate and, and to be recognized as a part of all kinds of strategies. But today, a lot of the relevant policies, some of them sit with industry ministries, some sit with waste management, others sit with, uh, you know, in, in particular bits to do with the built environment, etc. And it's all incredibly fragmented in institutional terms. So both for a sort of governance, governance and, and uh, policy making type of angle and also from a business angle it's only when you put together various pieces of puzzle you can get a new business model to work 
and we really need to have the language and to identify what, that this is a big thing and not, not a small marginal thing. So in a way, you could argue, as we do in the recommendation parts of our report, that any government or any business serious about having a climate strategy cannot afford not to include any circular economy strategy, right? Yeah, I, I think that's right. And then certainly, once it when for, in, and at different points for different countries, right? Any country such as that of the European Union, which is now thinking about a net, a net zero economy within a few decades, and foregoing this will make it tremendously much harder, right? as at a minimum, it may not be possible. And for countries that are rapidly trying to uh, you know, achieve lower emissions while also you know, building out infrastructure, urbanizing, increasing materials use in various ways, and the claims on uh, just, just the challenge of building out steel supply and building out you know, chemical supply and all the rest is also, this takes the edge of that tremendously, right? So wh whoever you are really in thinking about combining future well-being with low, low carbon and low carbon emissions, um, you know, circular economy really doesn't apply.